Respected viewers, brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to a new and fresh episode of Ziyarat al Arba'in 1438-2016 with me, your host Ahmad Ali. Now, inshallah, tonight our discussion uh, has changed from the previous nights. Uh, when someone tries to look at a certain individual and take them as an inspirational or as a person that affects their daily lives and affects them spiritually as well as physically. Now some people tend to not look at a person who is 1400 years old who did not possess the same technology as we did. This is why tonight's topic revolves around how can we use connect with Imam Hussain alayhi salam. This topic will be discussed with our very dear and esteemed guest Dr. Sheikh Osama Al Attar. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Allah khalikum, Allah. Thank you very much. How for are you? Having me here. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil it's alameen. a blessing to be here among this holy city, you know, with the, surrounded by these holy shri uh, shrines and, and, and the, the, the love and the passion of the people, mashallah. Yes. We have a uh, lot of, uh, of, of guests here this year. I've noticed, mashallah, millions. Mm -hmm. uh, overcrowded, I would say, mashallah, it, it compared is. to the previous year. Yes. So, so uh, it's, it's amazing and inspirational to see this love and the passion people have to Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam. And indeed, mm -hmm. marking this gathering to be probably the most, uh, uh, in terms of number wise, peaceful gatherings oh, yes. in the world. Uh, yes. Especially if you take a look at the, the time span here over the course of about three weeks. Having yes. all these millions of Zawag oh, to come yeah. here. So indeed, it's, it's a blessing to be here in this holy city of Karbala, next to the holy shrines of Ahlul Bayt alayhi musalam. Alhamdulillah, it's an honor to host you as well. Uh, but the thing is, uh, you've come here three years ago uh, to Karbala. Now, what's the difference in atmosphere, uh, in uh, crowdiness, if you will, uh, in terms of everything? Uh, how do you feel in comparison between today and three years uh, back? Well, uh, I find it a lot more people this year compared mm -hmm. to three years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, today we are only the eve of the 16th day of Safar. Um, like five days of so still about four or five days away from the, the, the Arba'in. And uh, remembering from three years ago, this time of the, of the year was busy but a lot less busy than what we saw today in mm -hmm. fact today as we were coming uh, and, and walking towards karbala we saw mashallah the number the crowds of the people has probably doubled it's huge at least it feels it, it's doubled from the time when 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 i walked three years ago because uh, three years ago the road um, coming from najaf basically mm -hmm. uh, the main road for the walkers was um, relatively busy mm -hmm. Today was not only the main road for the walkers, but it actually uh, overflowed onto the main street as well where the cars the are there. Yeah. And that was getting busy as yeah. well. So mashallah, you know, it feels there's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I mean, this year they expect 30 million. Alhamdulillah, uh, so you know what? I mean. As Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam says, Inna li jaddi al-Husayn alayhi salam harara yes. fi qulub al-mu'mineen la tutfa'u abada. That there's that, that flame of passion yes. in the hearts of the mu'mineen, of the believers for my grandfather Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam that will never be extinguished. Mm -hmm. And here we see a, a, you know, a beautiful uh, demonstration. I yes. mean, right now for our viewers uh, who may be with us, uh, it's about you know 11 p.m. in Karbala time, yes. and I can tell you, looking just outside, read the window right now, it's it's packed. It's packed. You know, where it's probably going to take me probably half an hour to get to a, a place, which takes me usually maybe about five minutes. Yeah. So Alhamdulillah, you know, this is really something that we need to bring out to the world. The world needs to realize what is this? Yes. Who is Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam, who drives people 1,400 years later? to come to his shrine to mm -hmm. say ya Hussein, to fulfill their call, the call of Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam. 30 million as Brother Ahmed just mentioned right mm -hmm. now. What is happening out there? Why is this going on? What is the secret of Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam? I see. think the world needs to realize and as you can see on the screen right now, you can see the numbers that I've been talking about here between the two harams of Al Hussein and Al Abbas alayhi salam. And, and we need to bring the attention of the world about this. You know what, something that hurts me, Brother Ahmed, mm -hmm. is the, I come from Canada and about a month ago, there was a news on the Toronto Star, mm -hmm. which is one of the uh, newspapers there in Probably Canada. Newspapers, yeah. um, it, the, the news was about a raccoon 
that they found on the window of one of the floors of the Toronto Star building. Okay. So they shot a picture of this cute little raccoon, uh -huh. and they're like, how did this raccoon climb up all the way there? And, and this made the story and, and, and the headlines in the Toronto Star. Oh. And here I am thinking, well, it's, it's interesting. I mean, they thought this is newsworthy, and they published it. Um, so a raccoon makes it to the front pages and the headlines, wow. and 30 million people coming Don't. to the shrine of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam does not make even the news. In, in, in most media outlets out there in the world. And, and you wonder why, mm -hmm. how come is there? People need to be educated. So um, Definitely. My, my call to the viewers and my request to them, please bring this to the attention of people. Tell Definitely. them what is going on out here because this is the true Islam. Definitely. And these are the people who stood up for Islam. They, 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 they fought for the true Islam. They fought for human dignity, human justice. Yes. These are the people who 1400 years ago said there is no difference between John the Black versus Ali al-Akbar versus Wadah the Turkish slave versus Habib ibn Mabahar al-Asadi. There is no difference between black and white, master and slave. These are the people who actually presented us with the social values that Definitely. today we are hearing about in the news with, with movements like, you know, Black Lives Matter. You know, mm, these yeah. movements were established by Ahlul Bayt or were actually implemented by Ahlul Bayt 1400 years ago. This is what the people need to learn about. Definitely, and uh, now of course, I mean, uh, just touch upon uh, the fact that you said, I mean, half, if not the majority, we can say easily, easily 80, 20% uh, that certain individuals look at history as something that happened in the past and has no effect in the future. People tend to say that, you know, the past is the past and we're the men of today. Instead of not realizing that uh, there's a quote by Hassan it says in the bones of the uh, ancestors, the future begins, mm -hmm. and s something around those lines. But they don't realize that the past actually affects the future mm -hmm. really much. And that's the idea of today, is that how can we use in the 21st century, compare ourselves with the Imam, not so much compare, but relate to the Imam that is, first of all, 57 years old, second of all, 1400 years ago, and third, not the same technology as we have today. As you mentioned, you said people need to always spread this, whatever's going on, the occasion, the Arba'in, spread it with the ease of technology. This is capable. But how can we relate to an individual who was 1400 years ago, 50 years old? So. Just like you mentioned, you know, history is really important. Some people say we study history just for the sake of studying history. Mm -hmm. But then there is that view where we study history with, with an analytic look at mm -hmm. history to learn from it, mm -hmm. uh, to learn lesson from it. And then there is a third view where we should be reading history and narrating it without adding any moral or personal twist to it. Yes. Uh, there is a fourth view which says, no, we cannot relate history or narrate history without adding any of our personal twist or taste to history. you got to be moral about history. Just like movies. Uh, kind of, you know, basically. So there's a paper written, you know, by James Crackraft yes. uh, a few years ago, who's, he's a historian, who says that some historians are trying to shift away from being uh, sounding any moral uh, tones into narrating history. So basically you just narrate history the way history was and leave it up to the reader to kind of judge it, learn from it, mm -hmm. analyze it. Uh, but he says that doesn't really work. When we report history, we need to be moral about it. We need to be explicitly expressing our views mm -hmm. on what happened in the past. Mm -hmm. Things that were right, we explicitly, ex uh, explicitly say that they are right. And mm -hmm. those that were immoral, the, that stood against human values, then we need to be basically stating that this is against human values. Yes. And that is the kind of notion where the Quran, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, when he addresses Fir'aun, when he addresses Namrud, um, he basically states these people were not right. These people were among those who are misguided. Mm -hmm. uh, and when it comes to people like Musa alayhi salam and the, the, the prophets, then the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises them. So that is the approach that we need to take to history. Mm -hmm. If we take that kind of an approach to history, then when we look at Imam Hussein alayhi salam 
and we look at the circumstances in which he rose. Mm -hmm. To be honest with you, interestingly, there will be a lot of relationships uh, and, and, and things that we can relate to mm -hmm. in today's world. Really? For example, let me give you one example. I would like our viewers to pay attention to this, please. Mm -hmm. um, Yazid ibn Muawiyah, mm -hmm. in his days, he created what we can call today the caste system. Yes. If you were a loyal to the Umayyads dynasty, then you were an individual who was enriched, you were among the elite, what we may call today the 1%. Mm -hmm. um, if you Thank were you. not part of that establishment, mm -hmm. then you were an outcast, yes. and you were basically making a lot less money. In fact, you are living in deprivation. Let's look at the world today, how things are happening. So Imam al Hussein, one of the things he rose against when he led his revolution against Yazid ibn Muawiyah is this kind of unfair treatment of individuals mm -hmm. where for example let me just give you my brothers and sisters an, an analogy at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, mm -hmm. there were people who differed sometimes in the opinion with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. sometimes they protested against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, but the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi never outcast them he yeah. never for example uh, ordered their execution he never for example even kicked them out not even he deprived them so this is the kind of Islam, this is the kind of justice that we need to establish in the world today. And mm -hmm. the same thing applies to Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Some of those Kharijites came to Imam Ali and explicitly told him, we disbelieve in you, we do not appreciate you, we do not believe in you as a, as a leader and as a master. And he replied back to them saying that, as long as you do not harm anyone, yes, then really. we will continue to protect you, we will continue to take care of you, and we will continue to pay you your monthly salaries, basically your wages, um, and, and you'll receive whatever right you will have with mm -hmm. us from the Muslim treasury. Mm -hmm. So that is the kind of Islam Imam al Hussein rose for. That's mm -hmm. the kind of politics he fought for. Mm -hmm. The politics of fairness and equality, the politics of uh, equity, and social justice. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's come today. Fast forward 21st century. Yes. Okay. So, how many people today live under the poverty line? How See many people? How many people today are rising because of unequal pays, uh, because of the lack of social justice? Yes. You know, I'll quote one Nobel laureate. In 2006, the Nobel Peace Prize winner was a Muslim man by the name of Dr. Muhammad Yunus yes. from Bangladesh. Yes. He has a book called The Social Business. In this book, Dr. Muhammad Yunus states that one of the problems that we have in the world today where we see so much poverty mm -hmm. is not because there is a lack of the resources, mm -hmm. but there is an unfair distribution of these resources. Yes. So he says, for example, 94% of the world's wealth is in the hands of 40% of the world's, world's population. population. Yes. So my, my, my viewers, put that into perspective. Uh, if you have a pie with 100 slices and yes. you have 100 people in the room, yeah. logic dictates that each person gets one slice and that will suffice that individual. Yes. That's what logic dictates. However, what the reality of the world today we live in is that 94 slices are given to 40 people and the remaining 60 people in the room are told, here are six slices, share. good luck, share them. So what will you have happening? Wars, problems, poverty, uh, and so many social problems. Yes. And that's a vicious cycle because once people are in hunger, then obviously these people can find it difficult to get education. Definitely. These people then once they don't have education, then you have a, an increased rate of ignorance. With ignorance comes a lot of problems. Yes. Um, and etc. etc. So we're not saying that Islam is a social socialistic view as some people put it, like mm -hmm. you know, 100 then each one gets. No, yeah. we're not th saying this, but we're saying about a fair distribution. Definitely. For example, Islam does not say anything against a person who becomes a wealthy businessman. In fact, Islam encourages it. Of course it. not. However, what Islam says is when you become wealthy, then don't forget about what paying your charity. Yes. 20% homes, for example, if you have zakat that you have to pay, then you can pay your zakat. In addition, you're encouraged to pay that uh, sadaqat, which is the, the recommended, uh, besides the mandatory uh, almsgiving. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the, this is what Islam is saying. Mm -hmm. Now, imagine 
the world today. How many people are suffering? As Dr. Muhammad Yunus is saying, 40% of the population has got 94% of the world's wealth. Well, of course, if you look around the world, then you find that. And, and so that's very sad. So we, we go back to what Imam al Hussein alayhi salam said. He said that we need to defend people's rights. He rose and stood on the grounds that we refuse to live in humiliation. We want equal social values and system to humanity. Mm -hmm. And isn't this what we're having over here today? Definitely. A few years ago, we had a big movement after the financial crisis called the 99%, that mm -hmm. we are 99%. Yes. Where basically people are saying the 1% elites are making the same salary as 99% of the population. And it is this 1% that's making all the decisions for the 99%. And that's why they rose and said, we are the 99%. Yes. In other words, we need to be making these decisions mm -hmm. as opposed to these individuals. Uh, we have movements like the Black Lives Matter, where they're saying basically um, African Americans are not being treated with justice in some parts of the world, maybe mainly in the United States. Mm. Uh, and, and we need to kind of get social More equality here. Yes. So that's what Imam al Hussein stood for yes. 1400 years ago. So these are some of the values that Imam al Hussein stood for 1400 mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. And that's why people relate to Imam al Hussein. Because when they come to visit him, these millions that we just saw outside just not too long ago, these people, when they come, they relate to these values. Definitely. They feel for these values because this is what they are experiencing. This is what they're suffering. And Imam al Hussein stood there to challenge these systems and the tyrants and the oppressive regimes mm -hmm. that go against the rights of humanity. Mm -hmm. Now, we spoke about uh, how Imam al Hussein and these individuals can actually relate to him in this matter of standing up for social justice, standing up for equity. And we do see on Hussein al Islam his first interaction with Al Hur when he cut the road off of Hussein from going to Kufa. He did not treat him with. with hostile did not fight him but yet Hur was thirsty he offered him water he offered the horses water so we do see the social justice that Imam Hussein rose for but the idea is is that how can we I mean for example uh, in, in Karbala we, it ranges from a six month old baby up to a hundred year old over a hundred year old men how can we relate to those individuals? I mean, relating to social justice, yes, we understand that. You know, Ahl bayt came and the Quran was set down, Prophet Muhammad. Their aim focus was to share everything equally, was to provide a better way of life, introducing that way of life. But how can we, as a teenager, up to mid-20s, and even the elders, you know, there's a saying that goes, uh, shaitan, is happy when he sees an old man sinning and is saddened or is angered when he sees a youth worshiping Allah subhanahu wa or doing the right thing. So doing the right thing, how can we relate that to Imam Hussain al-Islam who was, I repeat, 1400 years ago? You know, uh, ideologies, they last not within a particular era, mm -hmm. they go forever. Yes. We have many ideologies introduced by different philosophers mm -hmm. and that are still being practiced until this day and age. Mm -hmm. um, one thing we need to clarify is that the ideologies of Ahlul Bayti alayhim salam are the most complete and perfect mm -hmm. ideologies. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, says... In what sense? Well, Allah says, "Al-yawma akmaltu lakum dinakum, wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa raziitu lakum al-Islam dina." Today, I have completed your religion for you, perfected your religion for you, and have completed my blessings upon you, and I've accepted Islam as a religion for you. Mm -hmm. The religion is complete. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what we mean by that. Islam, as taught by the Prophet والسلام, is a complete, the most complete, perfect and comprehensive system. Mm -hmm. For example, when we come to Islam from a social system, 
Does Islam address social issues? And yes, it does. Mm -hmm. uh, political system. Does Islam address a political political stand? Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely, it does. Uh, from a financial system. Does Islam have a financial system, an institution? And we say, yes, it does. Mm -hmm. A spiritual system, yes, it does. And so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. There are certain religions out there in the world today which, that only address the spiritual aspect of things. So this is where we're spirituality, we're concerned with the spiritual um, nature of, of human being. Mm -hmm. When you come to this kind of a religion and tell them, okay, can you give me please a, a financial system mm -hmm. that we can implement in this religion? And they'll tell you, we don't really have that because that's not what we address. We address yes. the spiritual aspect yes. of things. Um, the Bible, for example, states, there's a verse which some people have quoted it differently, mm -hmm. interpreted differently, yes. but give to Caesar what's unto Caesar and yes. give to God what's unto God. Yes. Some Christians, I'm not saying all of them, you know, some of them say, well, this means there's a separation of church and state. Others, of course, argue against that. They say yes. this is not what the verse means, so you're taking it out of context. But what, I, what I'm saying is that in some cases, the, in some religions, we, fi we find that separation. There is that religion, and then we have the state, and the state matter. Islam is all one package. Mm -hmm. So. When it comes to this perfect, perfect, complete system, then if I want to implement a system that will ensure happiness and joy for humanity in mm -hmm. this world and in the hereafter, that's where I turn to the system of Islam as taught by Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam with the Master Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. 14, about maybe more than 14 years ago, uh, back in the late 90s, so uh, we're talking almost 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, we've had, um, mm -hmm. um, you know, do we need to go on a break? No, 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 uh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, 20 years ago, approximately, there was a man who comes from a group of Christians known as the Mennonites. Yes. The Mennonite Christians, they do not fight. They're pacifists. They believe that Jesus uh, spread peace and love, and we mm -hmm. need to always spread peace and love. So. One of their leaders, a man by the name of David Schenk, David Schenk somehow came across uh, Imam Ali alayhi salam. And he was inspired by the peaceful nature of Imam Ali alayhi salam. How he never initiated war, how he always accepted his enemies' views, how he embraced his enemies. And he really liked that. And he said, you know what, this actually kind of uh, is similar to what we believe in as Mennonites. So he initiated or he reached out to the Shia Muslims to establish what they call the Shia Mennonite dialogue because of that peaceful nature of Imam Ali alayhi salam, which is the peaceful nature of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa sallam. The beautiful example you just gave of Imam Hussein al Hur, mm -hmm. you know, look at the mercy of Ahlul Bayt. Yes. Hur is coming to stop Imam al Hussein from entering Kufa. Not now, to stop, but he was there to fight. That's right. I mean, he, he prevented him from entering Kufa and he took him to Karbala. Mm -hmm. Now, they, they found out that the Hugs army had run out of water. So Imam Hussein could have just stood there, mm -hmm. waited for them to basically die of thirst mm -hmm. or become very weak from their yes. thirst. And they could have fought them and, and, and destroyed them. Especially when there were only a thousand of Hugs army. Imam Hussein at the time had, uh, you know, quite a sizable amount. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, a few hundred people with him. So he could have overtaken them. Well, definitely. Um, but he said, no, this is not the way we fight war. Mm -hmm. I of hate course. to be commence war with them. And in fact, he gave Hur, his army, 1,000 men and their horses water. This was one of the reasons some of the historians say Imam Hussein ran out of water in Karbala because he gave a lot of his water to Hur and his army. Mm -hmm. So this is the values that we talk about when we talk about peace. Definitely. Today, the world is saying we want to achieve peace. We want to spread social justice. And mm -hmm. then my biggest question is how? How are you going to do that? Inshallah, we'll answer that after the break. Uh, but just before we go to break, the same thing in Nahrawan, when Imam Ali did not cut the water from Muawiyah, yeah, Muawiyah did Safin, the same to him. That is correct. Sorry, in Safin. That's absolutely uh, right. I, I yes. do apologize for that. Uh, but respected viewers, uh, the first part of tonight's episode is done with my uh, dear guest. Inshallah, we'll go into a short break and we'll continue our discussion after the break. So stay tuned. Come to me, come to me. Come back life to me. Oh, my son, oh, 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ديفيوز ورحمة الله وبركاته We are now continuing on our journey This is uh, our second day out on the field uh, on the outskirts of Basra near El Chapayish area um, It's Fajr time now, well, it's Shuruq time now We've just prayed but outside a mokib um, and the the owner of the mokib well Aba Abdullah is the owner of Al Muakib but it's the man who runs his mokib is the man that hosted us for the night and uh, he has respectfully forced us to uh, have breakfast at uh, his mokib and it is very rude for us to decline so inshallah we will go in we will speak to him we will have breakfast at his mokib then we will continue on our journey towards uh, Karbala walking with uh, all the other zawar as you can see they've already started walking at this early time so inshallah if you follow us we will uh, speak to the the owner and then we'll uh, see what drives him to serve Abu Abdullah al Hussein. انا حابب نشكركم على استضافتكم وبس حبيت اسالك كم سؤال تفضل انتم هسه جايين تخدمون تفتحون بيوتكم للعالم شنو هو اللي تقدموه اللي يفرق عن المواكب الاخرى شنو هو اللي يميزكم عن المؤسسات والمواكب الاخرى نعم اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وال محمد حياكم الله اهلا وسهلا ونحن في خدمتكم في موكب هيئة الصديقة الطاهرة عليها السلام محافظة البصرة قضاء المدينة منطقة البدران طبعا احنا في كل عام وفي كل سنة تمر علينا الذكرى الأليمة الحزينة ألا وهي أربعينية الإمام الحسين عليه السلام الإمام الذي جاهد وضحى بنفسه من أجل الإنسانية ويقول ما خرجت أحد بياناته من خرج من مدينة جده صلى الله عليه وآله يقول ما خرجت أشرا ولا بطرا ولكن خرجت لطلب الإصلاح في أمة جدي محمد صلى الله عليه وآله طبعا هنا أمرين قال أول شيء لآمر بالمعروف وشنو وأنها عن المنكر فسلام الله عليه يجسد هذه المعاني ونحن نستلهم من صاحب الذكرى الدروس العطرة والسيرة النيرة بالنسبة لسؤالك يعني شنو اللي يميزنا طبعا احنا هنا نقدم خدمة مو بس أكل فقط ولكن مفتوح بابنا للسؤال والجواب ولرد الشبهات العقائديه وخصوصا الشباب هنا من يسمعون بينا طلاب علم هنا يسالون اسئله دينيه وعقائديه واجتماعيه. فصلاه جماعه مستمره يعني بحمد الله الظهرين والعشاءين ونقدم ثلاث وجبات اكل للزوار والعصر نقدم يعني ما يحتاجه الزائر ان شاء الله. So I was saying, first of all, that whatever we do, whatever we provide, we have to take it from the Ahlul Bayt. And the lesson we took from the Ahlul Bayt is uh, when Abi Abdullah السلام, left, he says, I'm leaving to create Islah, to create justice uh, in my grandfather's Ummah. So he's calling for Amr al-Ma'roof, uh, fighting for good and preventing against bad or evil. So based on this, uh, we have set up our mokib. And what, um, what makes them different to the other mokib, uh, he sings, they provide uh, space for salah, dhuhrain, the asha'in. He says they provide three meals a day. He says, uh, he says they provide places to sleep, places to rest. He says they provide uh, Islamic questions because people know that they are Islamic students like religious studies students so uh, people know this and they come and ask questions 
they want to come and they want to learn more about religion because for those that don't know of certain things, certain masail, certain fiqh issues, they come here and they ask. And this is one of the main things that differentiates them from the other muakib. Shukran jazeera. Amir. Allah dekum. Respected viewers, brothers and sisters in Islam, once again, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Before the break, we talked about how today is connected with the past and how we can relate our lives to the lives of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam, specifically Imam al Hussein, peace and blessings be upon him. This was discussed with my dear and honorable guest, Sheikh Dr. Osama al Attar. Welcome back, Hayyu Sheikhna. Thank you very much. Allah khalikum, inshaAllah. The first part uh, of the episode was somewhat interesting. But if we turn the twist up a little bit, if you will. We mentioned everything about Ahl al-Bayt alayhim salam. But me as, as an individual, if I want to connect with them seriously, you mentioned you know, connecting with them uh, just before the break. We're talking about social justice mm -hmm. and freedom and how Imam al Hussein and Ali Nabi Talib ruled with justice and ruled with everything but the life that we live in right now no one rules with justice no one rules with equity as you mentioned uh, Muhammad Yunus mm -hmm. 94 to 6 percent right you know what I mean so it's it's a huge number and this is not just uh, randomly spoken this is statistics that we're talking about but yet they lived in a life where none of these obstacles were present I mean in today the whole world can be seen on a small tablet on a small iPad on a small phone but yet they, they didn't face the same stuff that we are facing right now mm -hmm. so is that possible for us to actually relate to those to, to Ahlul Bayt and what have they said in order for us to, to relate to them mm -hmm. because honestly as a youth th there's no connection other than religion well, you see, today the world is trying to strive for peace. Mm -hmm. You hear that in different... Uh, we don't see that, but yeah. But you hear it at least. Yeah. It's being said. Yeah. Two years ago, the G20, which is the, yes. you know, the, the major uh, players in the world's markets, yes. countries, they came out and I remember the Chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel, mm -hmm. she came out and she said that the G20, this was two years ago, 2014 and uh, it was in September I believe 2014 so the latter half or mm -hmm. part of 2014 she said the G20 have decided that by 2030 we will eradicate poverty from the world when I read this it was phenomenal mm -hmm. my first question that came to my mind is how are you gonna achieve that yeah okay the biggest question is how so so here you know this is something where people relate to Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam or can relate to Ahlul mm -hmm. Bayt alayhim salam. The world is trying to eradicate poverty by 2030. The question is how are you going to achieve that? Well, if we tell the world or at least if we tell our youth that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and Imam Ali alayhim salam being leaders, they managed to eradicate poverty among the people they governed. Mm -hmm. How did they achieve it? what methodologies did they implement what strategies did they follow mm -hmm. so that they have eradicated poverty mm -hmm. and that's where we need to encourage our youth to go back and look at it mm -hmm. but the thing is not everyone has the idea of eradicating poverty everyone has a different idea of, of absolutely so that's why i'm giving this as one example uh -huh. you know you're suggesting that people think religion 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 we're mm -hmm. saying you know uh, Ahlul Bayt offered this complete system for which people can achieve, humanity can achieve mm -hmm. peace, happiness, and social justice. Mm -hmm. well, what does entertainment play in this role? I beg your pardon? Entertainment. How does it play in the system of Ahlul Bayt? 
Well, we have, uh, in fact, uh, a couple of ahadith, uh, or several ahadith. Mm -hmm. One from Imam Amir al-Mu'min, mm -hmm. it says, divide your time into three portions. Mm -hmm. One for your worship, one for your work, and one for time for your comfort in ways that do not disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. So you can say entertainment, okay. but as long as within the boundaries of the Sharia. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, there's another hadith where Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam would say that to his companions after some lessons that, you know, now let's take a break. Mm -hmm. Now back taking a break in those days was poetry, was talking about, for example, uh, certain topics of interests that yeah. people would, would be intrigued by them. Mm -hmm. So that was their entertainment at the time. So See, that's what it's, it's different from now. That, well, it's, th it's that's what I'm trying to say. Okay, different in what say? In what L way? Like, for example, we just said that they occupy themselves with poetry, with what right now, if anyone occupies themselves with whatever, you know, mm -hmm. back then, he would be an outcast. Uh -huh. He would be the odd one out. Okay, so let's take a look at this then, uh, my brother Ahmed. You know, when psychologists introduce theories, mm -hmm. they talk about the human nature. Mm -hmm. Okay, They don't necessarily indicate, you know, uh, the specific actions of the era. Okay, So when we go back a step here, mm -hmm. let's go back a step and say, you know, you're saying people lived at the time of Imam Ali and Ahlul Bayt, salam, they did not find the same challenges that we did. They dealt with the same type of human people, personalities that we deal with. Mm -hmm. There was the greed, there was the betrayal, yes. there was the faithful, there were, and so on and so forth. They, they were the, which is the same kind of personalities we deal with in this day and age. The type of people have not changed. It's the mechanisms that have changed. Mm -hmm. So when we address issues, we go back to the roots. When we talk about entertainment, yes, the type of the entertainment has changed, maybe, given the societies, the cultures, and the eras, but the need for entertainment has not changed. People need a break. Yes. Okay. But when we go back, you know, the essence of the break is there in the Sharia. Mm -hmm. Take a break as long as it falls within the boundaries of the Sharia. Mm -hmm. So when you say today, for example, taking a break could be playing video games, could be watching the internet, mm -hmm. you know, surfing the internet, watching movies, etc. As long as these things fall under the boundaries of the Sharia, ah, we don't have a problem with them. Mm -hmm. The problem arises when these things fall outside the boundaries of the Sharia. Ah. Mm -hmm. And that's how I can relate to Ahlul Bayti alayhim salam. So it's not necessary that I sit there and read poetry mm -hmm. in my entertainment time and mm -hmm. I say myself, well, this is what Ahlul Bayt did, so this is what I'm going to do as yeah. well. But I can still go out and, and enjoy the entertainment of the day, mm -hmm. uh, but within the same boundaries that Ahlul Bayt laid down 1400 years ago. Mm -hmm. So the people that oppose this idea state that we are limited to what we are, but yet we're created as free humans. What do you mean? Who's we? We, we as, as Muslims, as humans. As Muslims or we're as humans? Uh, as Muslims. We'll take as it as Muslims. Muslims. Okay. We're limited to entertainment. Because, for example, if you're saying that watching a movie or playing a video game, you know, with the boundaries of Islam and the Ahlul Bayt, mm -hmm. well, the majority of it, 99% of the movies, they have to have something in it. 99% of the games either have killing, either have, you know, R-rated. We can mm -hmm. basically say that. Mm -hmm. So how can we do that? I mean, you're saying to relate everything to Ahl Bayt mm -hmm. and to always have the entertainment boundaries that please God and please the Ahl Bayt Islam at the same time. So how do we do that? You touched upon a very interesting topic here, um, which can go a bit deeper. You, mm -hmm. said, you said we're limited. You know, uh, and, and I, I'm, I guess, and correct me if I'm wrong, what you mean by limited as Muslims is that we have, uh, our freedom is slightly restricted. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, the question, is there anything called absolute freedom? Absolutely not. And there's, that does not exist. Uh, even if you go to the most developed countries in the world, can you drive any way you like? Of course the answer not. will be say no. You know, you have to drive within the boundaries of, uh, of the, laws of the and state and the laws and the, and the regulations. Can you uh, operate a company that you own any way you like to operate it? And again, Absolutely the answer not. will be no. You have to operate within the, the laws of the, the state. Yes. So there is no such thing as absolute freedom. Mm -hmm. the, 
or even when it comes to freedom of expression, mm -hmm. freedom of speech. Can a person, for example, stand in the middle of a, of a plane, in the middle of the air, and, sta and say, you know what, take this plane down, you know, there's going to be, for example, an explosive device on this plane. Immediately this person will be arrested. Mm -hmm. um, and if he says, well, this is free speech, say, no, no, my friend, you know, free speech has... A of speech. That's right. You mm -hmm. know, you, you, cannot, you cannot scare people, mm -hmm. create fear mm -hmm. in the hearts of people, in the minds of people, and call it free speech. Or walking in the hood and calling black people well, just them with you can you can say anything against Muslims like you want, and that's not considered hate speech, unfortunately. Hate speech. In this and, and it's unfortunate. Uh, you know, it's considered freedom of speech. But yeah. but leave, leave leave that alone. <laughs> yeah. What I'm trying to say is that even in the most developed countries in the world today, there is no such thing as absolute freedom. Mm -hmm. Freedom comes with boundaries, with the restrictions, and these suggest that you cannot infringe on the rights of other individuals mm -hmm. or even your own rights. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by that? You cannot commit suicide. Th that, you know, once a person is found to be suicidal and if the physicians state this individual is actually a danger to himself, then by law in some countries, this person will be given treatment. You know, even though he says, I don't want any medicines, I don't want any treatment. But if the physicians say that this person can actually harm himself, if he's deemed suicidal, then they will actually enforce uh, medications upon him mm -hmm. so that they kind of control his uh, moods and prevent him from killing his own self. Yes. So you cannot harm yourself in some extent or inflict harm upon other people, whether mm -hmm. it's physical or emotional mm -hmm. or verbal. Mm -hmm. Well, Islam comes to say the laws that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has dictated are for your own protection. Mm -hmm. They're to save you from harming yourself or harming the society. Our fault or our problem in this day and age is that we are falling short in understanding how these laws actually protect us, mm -hmm. how these laws actually save us. Let me give you a clear example that many of my viewers may agree with me on, and that is alcohol. Islam comes to say that alcohol is haram. Mm -hmm. You cannot drink it, you cannot do business with it, you cannot even sit at the table where alcohol is being served, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Let's take a look at the harmful effects of alcohol. Mm -hmm. Intoxication is one thing. In Canada alone, Four people die every single day in Canada from drinking and driving accidents. Yes. Okay. Four, day, four people every day, and that's in Canada alone. Okay. And we're not talking about those who get injured. We are not doc talking about those who get, for example, intoxicated and then they go kill other people. Uh, we're not talking about people who get intoxicated and get involved in domestic violence. Yes. None of this. We're just talking strictly drinking and driving accidents. Four people get killed every day in Canada on average. Okay, the government has tried to say, don't drink and drive, drink responsibly as they yes. say, but unfortunately it's not working. Okay. Islam comes and says it's haram. You cannot drink it, you cannot uh, sell it, don't uh, harvest it, because it has such harmful effects that mm -hmm. it can destroy societies. Definitely. Okay. And that's an issue that we have today. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Islam, can we say that, well, it restricts our freedom by not allowing us to drink alcohol? Well, no, the thing is, that's for our benefit, and we do get that from a health perspective, if you will. Now, you see how interesting how people accept that, but when it comes to issues like hijab, for example, people will start arguing against that. Yeah. But Allah said alcohol is haram, hijab is what? mandatory. Yeah. Alcohol is haram, gambling is also haram. Mm -hmm. uh, backbiting is also haram. You know, for example, you have to dress modestly. Definitely. Uh, prayers are mandatory, fasting is mandatory. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set all these rules. Now we sometimes tend to be choosers, we pick mm -hmm. and choose. You know, I like, you know, the idea that I can't drink and I don't really care about it, so I'll mm -hmm. accept that. And I know the benefits of it. But when it comes to wearing hijab, for example, acting in a modest way, uh, you know, watching what I see, what I listen to, that's where, oh, come on, you know, this is too restrictive of a religion. 
Mm -hmm. Who's choosing here? Do we pick and choose? And that's, isn't that what Imam Hussein stood for on the day of Ashura, where he said that people need to be the slaves of Allah and not the slaves of dunya. Yes. When we talk about Hur that you mentioned, and he says, I am choosing between heaven and the hellfire. And I'm having this internal conflict within myself, which is causing me to shiver. And I will never ever choose anything over heaven. Mm -hmm. That kind of a struggle we go through to as youth. You know, should I listen to the music or should I not listen to this music? You know, Jannah and Nar, you know, mm -hmm. heaven and hell. Should I wear the hijab the way Allah wants or should I not even care about it? Mm -hmm. Well, Jannah and Nar. You know, should I do this or should I not do this? Jannah and Nar. However, we don't talk about it in that perspective. What we would like to talk about it is from an educational perspective. Mm -hmm. If I explain to you that alcohol is harmful and it can really impact your life in a negative way, then hopefully I can persuade you or educate you about the harmful effects of alcohol and hence deter a person from consuming it. Mm -hmm. Well, if we can do the same thing about hijab, about paying khums, about praying salat on time, about being kind to your parents, mm -hmm. then hopefully we can make people realize and appreciate the beauty mm -hmm. of Islam mm -hmm. as Ahlul Bayt salam presented. You talk about Ashura. Mm -hmm. How can we relate to the people in Ashura 1400 years ago? Well, let's take a look at Ali Al-Akbar, how respectful he was to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, his father. And look, he achieved success in dunya and in akhirah. Well, I want to be successful in dunya and akhirah. I want to, uh, for example, get a good degree. Mm -hmm. I want to have a good reputation. I may want to have a good family in the future. I want to be successful. Well, one of the means of being successful in this dunya is by being kind to your parents. Mm -hmm. Be kind to them and you'll see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless you and bless your life in dunya. That's a way you can connect to Karbala. Do you want success? You go sometimes to these, some of those bookstores and you'll find some books on how to be successful, yeah. how to achieve success, uh, criteria for success. And you'll find lots of such books for sale. Well, Islam is giving you one formula and there are many others for success. One of them is be kind to your parents, mm -hmm. be respectful to them. That's something it's difficult for us youth to perceive because it is not something materialistic. You tell me, what does me being kind to my parent have to do with uh, success? And we say that's where alam al ghaib come in, the world of the unseen. But, but the, the thing is, even like on, on the opposite hand, you find people who just don't care about their parents, yet they're very successful. Six, how do you define success? Well, success in the materialistic form. Aha, see, see, sometimes, sometimes. But that's what we focus on in this dunya. But see, what aspect of materialistic? For example, we have, you know, a common example. I won't mention the name, but everyone knows what I'm talking about. A person who has just been elected as a president of a very prominent country in the world. From a materialistic perspective, he's very successful. Mm -hmm. um, he's got lots of money. He's got a lot of people working for him. And now he's basically got the most, I guess, prestigious position in the world, in today's mm -hmm. world. Yes. Um, so any further success than this? I guess not. However, how many people like him? How many people are protesting on the streets at this moment, saying that we dislike this individual? We don't want him to be our president. In fact, people are holding slogans saying, he is not my president. You know? wow. So is that really success then? Depends how you define success. If we define success as money, authority, then Harun al-Rashid was a very successful man in this world. But he killed Imam al-Kazim yes. alayhi salam. And just before he leaves this dunya, his final words was, ma aghna anni maliya, halaka anni sultaniya. Wow. That my wealth has not helped me and my kingdom has just perished. Wow. So is this really the success we're talking about? And he died at the age of 43. That's yeah. Harun al-Rashid. Not only this, let me add you, let me add one more thing. He's buried right next to Imam al-Rida alayhi salam. They're buried in the same room. Imam al-Rida and Harun al-Rashid are in the same room. They're next to each other. So I mean, you say, oh, mashallah, you know, he's buried right next to the Imam. Oh, wow. So this is a great phenomenal. I mean, this guy is not only wealthy, he was, he was a king. He was like a great man in the That's sense, me. you know. But is this really the success we're talking about? Where people now don't, don't even remember, they don't even know where his grave is. Many people don't realize the grave of Harun is right next to Imam Mughrabah, mm -hmm. 
and how many people when they study the life of Harun really appreciate what he did okay so we need to realize what success are we leaving in dunya are talking about in dunya what legacy you want to leave behind you know, is it money is that really the end justifies money the will perish but if you want to achieve success materialistically and leave a good legacy then be kind to your parents that's one of the ways we learn from Ashura mm -hmm. you want to achieve legacy and success in dunya and in akhirah be a person like John John for example who was a slave from an African origin and he served Ahlul Bayt alayhi wasalam and died he was freed by Ahlul Bayt years earlier and on the day of Ashura Imam al Hussein told him you can leave me go John mm -hmm. He said, I will never leave you, Ya Aba Abdullah. And look at the legacy he's left behind. Of course. Where we people stand, our ulama, mm -hmm. our scholars today stand before John and say, Be Abi Anta wa Ummi. May my father wow. and mother be sacrificed for you. I mean, These are our maraja al taqlid. They mm -hmm. say that to John. Mm -hmm. So, isn't that a legacy? Isn't that the success you want to leave behind? I mean, of course. And the thing is, that also illustrates something is that even Mount Hussein on the day of Ashura, he made equal between his son Ali al-Akbar and John Hassan. and he, he he actually portrayed that but I would like the show has ended mm -hmm. we have come to the end of the show I'd like to thank you for joining us thank you very uh, inshallah much inshallah we'll continue the discussion uh, tomorrow thank, uh, you, thank very you very much, much for, for having me here inshallah and I thank our viewers for listening to us inshallah inshallah I personally my dear viewers will remember you in, your in my dua and I associate you in my ziyar of Abi Abdullah al Hussein. May Allah grant you that thawab and you join us soon inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. Thank you very much for joining Sanjur. us tonight. Respect to the viewers, thank you very much for tuning in tonight. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to continue serving Ahlul Bayt and taking them as our role models in this life and in the hereafter. Thank you very, very much for tuning in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.